Hey friends, here's a question for you. Are human embryos like cancerous tumors or are they more like parasitic leeches? The answer is both and neither. And that what this really is, is a dishonest game used by anti-choicers to misrepresent the facts. So let's get into the reality of embryonic development. This little tweet from Dylan Griswold appeared in my timeline. Mr. Griswold is an MD candidate who seems to have missed a great many classes because he's speechless at this fairly mundane science slide. It says that the fetus is a legitimate parasite, and in many ways it is, but not in all ways, as we'll see. It rapidly grows at the expense of its host, it invades tissues, it manipulates the immune system to avoid rejection, and it stimulates the growth of blood vessels to provide it more nutrients. This is all true. Then the slide compares a fetus to cancer, which also grows rapidly, invades tissues, manipulates the immune system, and attracts blood vessels. Also completely true. And then Mr. Griswold arrogantly asks us to provide a better caption for this. Uh, no, I can't, because this is a pretty good caption. How about if we just use the one on the slide, already on the slide? Parallels between fetuses and cancers. That's totally correct. There are strong similarities between how cancers and fetuses behave because cancers are simply appropriating genetic mechanisms that have utility in embryonic development. What leaves me speechless is that an MD candidate is unaware of all the research being done to explore these mechanisms and how the logic of the comparison is irrefutable and based on evidence. I hope he's not planning to be a cancer specialist. I really hope he's not going into obstetrics or gynecology. I'm going to start tearing into this tweet from an embryological perspective, since that's where my interest lies, and then we'll get into the cancer literature. So let's begin with fertilization and implantation. The potential mother releases an egg into the fallopian tubes, where with a little luck, good or bad, depending on your point of view, it will be fertilized with sperm from the father. At that moment, a new life begins. No, wait, that's anti-choice bullshit. The egg is alive, the sperm is alive, the zygote is alive. There's no change in life state here. If you want to argue for anything, it's that the fertilized egg has a unique combination of genetic traits and is different genetically from both the mother and father. That's actually going to be a problem because it is antigenically unique and has a potential to trigger an immune response from the mother. The zygote spends about a week slowly bumbling down the fallopian tubes, dividing to make multiple cells as it goes, until it finally reaches the uterus, and then uses specialized cells it has formed to latch on and implant into the uterine wall. It is this process of implantation that attracts the comparisons to both cancers and parasites. The membranes of the embryo bind to the endometrium of the mother and proliferate madly to infiltrate and recruit maternal tissues, stimulating angiogenesis to draw in a blood supply, rooting itself deeply into the mother's flesh, and secreting hormonal signals to suppress local inflammation and immune responses. And it's also trying its best to control maternal metabolism. Gestational diabetes, for instance, is a response to the embryo trying to compel mom to deliver more sugar to itself. Other changes are going on at the cellular and molecular level, illustrated here with a sea urchin embryo. The embryo is initially a sheet of cells, an epithelium, formed into a hollow ball, and then some cells delaminate from the sheet to form loose migratory cells called mesenchyme, which are shown at the arrows here. This is called the epithelium to mesenchyme transition, EMT for short, and it's an important plastic behavior in the developing embryo and placenta. It's how cells form different masses and migrate to new locations. There's also a complementary process called the mesenchyme to epithelium transition, or MET, 
and it's part of a critical system to animal development in which cells fluidly move and form new structures in the embryo. EMT happens all over the place in lots of tissues. The mechanisms of switching from a simple sheet to a migratory mass are of great interest to developmental biologists. And you may notice that this table comes from Weinberg's cancer textbook, The Biology of Cancer. So it's of great interest to cancer biologists too. There's a lot of overlap here. If only cancer cells remained in solid masses, they'd be relatively easy to treat. But they don't. Some cells in the tumor can undergo EMT, switch to that fluid migratory state, travel through the blood or lymphatic system, and then through MET form a new tumor elsewhere. This is called metastasis. And as any cancer patient knows, it is a bad thing. The cancer is using that embryonic fluidity to expand and colonize other tissues. Which leads cancer biologists to look to developmental biology to understand this dangerous form of pattern switching, and developmental biologists to look to oncology for experimental parallels. For example, here's a paper titled Exploring the Links Between Cancer and Placental Development. The placenta is an embryonic tissue that, like a cancer tumor, is going to invade a maternal tissue. On the left is a normal placenta using trophoblast cells to invade the maternal endometrium. On the right is a cancer in yellow invading a healthy epithelium. These are similar events on a cellular and molecular scale. Note the figure title. Parallels between placenta and solid tumor formation. Rather similar to the upper level biology slide, it triggered this discussion, right? Note also that it says, Solid cancer resembles placenta development in several aspects, including the formation of new vessels and the ability to invade surrounding tissues and to evade the immune responses. That, too, was the point of the original slide. This is not controversial at all. Do you need more? Here's a 2006 article in which the abstract says, Cancer may arise because the developmental programs that create the dramatic alterations in form and structure in embryonic development are potentially corrupted. The cells in our bodies retain memories, I don't particularly like that phrase at all, of these processes, and cancer can occur later in life if imperfections occur in the fidelity of these pathways. This article is particularly interested in the phenomenon of epithelial to mesenchyme transition, which occurs in embryogenesis. Listen, I, I have a whole library of this kind of article because I'm a developmental biologist who has taught cancer biology courses and did a postdoc on a cancer training grant. The lines are often blurred between embryology and oncology. There are a lot of phenomena in cancer that are strongly linked to developmental processes, and recognizing the parallels is a fruitful line of research. This is a diagram from one of the most highly cited review articles in cancer biology, illustrating the different phenomena involved in cancer growth with potential treatments for each. Growth and proliferation is common to both embryos and cancers. Embryos have to manipulate the maternal immune system to avoid rejection, just as cancers do. Cancers in the placenta both use angiogenic factors to stimulate growth of blood vessels. Cancer cells and embryonic cells undergo important changes in morphology and can exhibit cell motility and migration. The case is clear that these fields of study are intertwined. But, you might reasonably ask, are there differences between a tumor and an embryo? And yes, of course, and no one is denying it. Embryonic development is an orderly process to generate a specific form. Cancer is inherently disorderly. One of the goals of scientists making this comparison is to ask what regulative process that is present in embryos is broken in cancers, so that maybe we can figure out how to reapply the breaks. It's a perfectly legit and useful parallel to draw. Acting like this is a joke is simply an ignorant response. But what about the other part of the slide? Can we compare an embryo to a parasite? 
that's more problematic because the definition of a parasite is designed to exclude maternal embryo relationships. That bit right there where it says an organism of another species means parasite is not strictly applicable. That's a little bit arbitrary, though, because the rest is perfectly appropriate. The embryo is leaching off the mother's nutrients. Bringing an infant to term is hard, draining, metabolically expensive work. It's also dangerous to carry a fetus. Gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and injury or infection in labor are not uncommon. It's also possible for trophoblastic invasion to go too far, where those embryonic tissues will burrow right through the uterine wall to invade the salome and colonize other organs. So while technically incorrect, the functional effect on the mother is very much similar to parasitic infection, and once again, it's useful to make the comparison. And now for something slightly different. I have to criticize Dylan Griswold for being medically ignorant, and I hope no one has, has to ever have him for a doctor. But what he did is also despicable for other reasons. He sparked a whole lot of ignorant assertions from anti-choice zealots, and he's going to be the darling of other ignorant people. This is one of the milder responses, and it's utter nonsense. No, there is no evidence that fetuses are healing maternal organs. This does not even make sense. But also, what Griswold was doing was irresponsibly appealing to an ignorant mob to go after a professor at a different university who was actually teaching good, well-supported science that did not back up his ideological presuppositions, just like this uninformed fool who was making up false facts. Since then, the story has been picked up by Infowars, which ought to make Griswold ashamed. It got to the point that the professor who presented the original information had to issue an explanation. So he said, most of you probably realize that my point was to show that mammals are especially prone to invasive cancers because mammals involved invasive placentation. My point was not to indoctrinate you with the notion that fetuses are cancers, as insinuated in the article. Remember, the caption of the original slide was parallels between fetuses and cancers. It was 100% correct and valid. But this is what happens in the hands of rabid ideological tools of the anti-choice movement. Insinuations are made to discredit legitimate scientific information, and it gets spread through media like Infowars. And I find it very troubling that there are medical students who promote anti-science propaganda. <laughs>